because it's so carefully it's after 12:45. Okay, so let's go. Welcome everybody. Uh, I, I'm Bo Anders, a uh, member of the board of directors of the book festival, and I know you've heard this talk three or four times already today, so I will be brief. We're here for a reason, and the reason is that our expenses are growing and our contributions from sponsors are staying about the same. It's not sustainable for us. We want to make this a festival that's free for everybody, but we need your help. Those of you who are not sponsors or literati and haven't contributed to date, please consider looking at the back of your program where there is a QR code to contribute via Venmo, or there are yellow buckets at the back of the room that you can drop in some cash on your way out. I will tell you that right now, that Venmo program is becoming very successful and we're very appreciative of everybody who's given to that. Enjoy, Marianne, and we'll see you later. Hello everybody, my name is Fran Kelly and welcome to the 16th annual Savannah Book Festival and I'm going to say who a lot of the donors are but I think after that lovely plea I'm not going to go into please give us more money in the yellow buckets etc etc. I think you know what to do. So um, this year's festival is presented by the Philip E. and Nancy B. Beekman Foundation, David and Nancy Citron. Robert Faircloth, the Courtney Knight Gaines Foundation, and the Gerald D. and Helen M. Stevens Foundation, with a special thanks to a grant from Georgia Humanities. We're especially grateful to John and Fran Kane for sponsoring the Jepson Neeson's Nieces Auditorium today. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of announcements. Marianne Wiggins will be signing festival purchased books uh, in Telfair Square immediately following the presentation. And if you're planning to stay for the next author, Todd Do uh, Doughty, in conversation with Jack Romanos, please move forward to fill the seats so the uh, ushers can count the remaining empty ones. Um, please make sure to uh, make sure your telephone is turned off and we ask that you don't use flash photography. Uh, I will skip that because you just said that. And um, okay, we will have the opportunity to answer, uh, to have questions and answers at the end of the talk. Please raise your hand, and there is somebody who will be holding a microphone for you. And please try to keep your questions short. So, Marianne Wiggins is with us today, courtesy of Bo and Chris Anders. She is the author of eight novels including John Dollar and Evidence of Things Unseen, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and the National Book Award. She has won a Whiting Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, the Heidinger Kafka Prize, and was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction. She lives in Venice, California. Please give a warm Savannah welcome to Marianne Wiggins and her daughter, Laura Forza. or can I lean into mom's mic? Hello? Well, hi everybody, I just broke my mom's glasses, which will be great for her two minute reading. I'm Lara, and thank you for that beautiful introduction, Fran, I really appreciate it. Thank you all for being here today. Yes. Thank you um, also to Chris and Bo Anders for your boundless generosity, you can make me cry, heartfelt generosity as our sponsors. And mama, thank you for writing such a beautiful book. I'm forgiving birth and for giving birth to me. <laughs> Always grateful for that. Yep. 
That was the hard work. That was hard, really hard work. We're going to start. Marianne's going to do a very short reading to get the ball rolling. Where? We're going to start you here. I Mama, need my glasses. I know. I just broke them. I'm going to give them to you here. Can you lean in here and see if can you hear? Say something. Something. <laughs> okay. History. It's down here, and I'm going to put broken glasses oh. on you. This is hilarious. Whoa. I'm sorry, sweetie. Okay. Whoa. Now I can't see them. That's good, though. You want to see what you're reading. History okay. will always, it's right here. History will always find you. You want to read this? No, you're going to start okay. here. History will always find you. He knew that. Every veteran of every war would tell you every survivor of an oppressive regime, every victim of poverty, every martyr to religion, you know, I can't see, any gull of economic promise, every dupe of political idealism, any woman on the street with nothing left to lose but the clothes on her back, history will find you. On the dust-ravaged plains in 1932, in France or Germany, Belgium, Italy, or Japan, in California in its rain shadow, on your wedding day, or when your kid is born, when your boat sails, or when your loved one disappears, history will find you. Your own history will come for you when you are sleeping, in your bed, or starting breakfast, staring out a window. What we, know, what we do with these unbidden moments may define how we choose or do not choose to live. For most people, the range of choices comes in tiny increments. Dare I look another in the eye? Dare I ask for help? Whelped by chance, none of us can claim, oh, I'm reading faster than your fingers go, None of us can claim to outrun fate's, fate's chicanery, what, that history finds us where we live. History has borne us to a time when all the gaps on all the maps have been filled in, when the known world means the whole world, where the prospect of fixed point in the plot's beginning is as distant as a faded star in a fabled far-off galaxy. Where do I begin not to tell a story? That's the easy part. The story starts with some first words or a datable event. I was born, we went to war, she died. But where do I and you or anyone begin? The past is much more mesmerizing than the future. The future will reveal itself regardless, but the past is made to disappear. Excellent. Thanks. Oh. A story starts with some first words. Yeah, well, sure. What do you think it was about your first visit to Manzanar that sparked your imagination? Oh, good question, and thank you thank for you. taking me there. For those of you who may not know, Manzanar was a was called a camp. Basically, it was a prison um, d um, made by our government during World War II. Our government rounded up. American citizens of Japanese um, descent. descent, thank you, <clears throat> and, and some Germans, but mostly Japanese, um, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. But they were American citizens. I was not taught this in my American education. I went to public school in Pennsylvania, and I wasn't taught this. And so when you f first took me there, I thought, oh my God, how, you know, this history has been forgotten. And that's such, one of the wonderful things about being here is that history still lives. I've visited, you know, you walk along the street and that's where general so-and-so and private so-and-so fought in the Civil War. 
or something took place, it's pointed out to you. And I think we need that as human beings. We're 2,000 years now into our history, we're told. And I think that we need to know how previous generations lived so that we can make the future more livable for future generations. At least that's what I take as my remit as an American writer. So history will find us. I mean, I am the granddaughter of immigrants. Um, they tossed up on the American shores, thank, bless their bones. They're now dead, obviously. Both my parents are dead. And, and I want to know about this country that they came to. And that has, that has been my stamp, stamped on, into my bones as, as an American writer. And all of my subjects have been the spine of a book to open the uh, modern American mind to our American past. So I write books with history in them, but historical fiction has become a moniker um, of popular his, his fiction. Um, historical fiction has to do with hooped skirts and men who wore swords running down their legs. And he sit down. Um, and, you know, historical fiction tends to be revolving around the Scarlet O'Hara age. I don't write that that way. I don't write of that period. I write histor history fiction. Fiction that takes place in an era in which I do not live, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, I'm also a, a was a professor at a university in Southern California, and I find, I have found that my students are not as aware as I was having been, I was born in a pre-television age. And although I must say, if they're in a writing program, the students are dedicated to books, but their knowledge of American history and their reading history has not, it's not very deep. It's not very wide either. Um, it's about this big. Um, <laughs> And so I, I've been impressed with the mandate has been given to me from my personal experience to write, to incorporate history into, into my modern fiction um, as a way of expanding knowledge. And that's important to me. And also because I was I started as a writer, probably, because I read as a child, and I was quite ill as a child, and the severity of my illness, I have one, one kidney, my second kidney having been removed when I was nine years old. And so because of the severity of that operation, I was put into the adult ward, and the book lady, I can hear her wonky wheel coming down the hallway even now. I started reading adult fiction. Um, War and Peace and other books. Like I didn't always read Russians. I also <laughs> read Americans. Um, but I read, I read adult fiction at a very early age and I think that made me into the writer that I am. And I wanted to write stories about my own country that reflected hi historical events, events. In the same way, I'm glad I'm preaching to the choir here because your city re reflects um, the history, its own history. And I came from a city that also reflected its own history and also reflected its, I mean, you know, let's face it, you gotta have money. Um, so there was a local and a current um, 
events that happened in my city. My city wasn't, you know, making a living for itself as your city is. But we have, we did not, we did not erase history. And popular fiction tends to do that. Historical fiction in this country has come to be um, synonymous with romantic fiction. Um, and it's easier to make romance in the past than modern romance, I think. Um, and, and anyway, I hope I answered your question. I've forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> I think she actually answered all three of the questions that we practiced. And been, future questions. And all of my future questions. So now I don't, I don't know what to talk about, Mom. I think um, I actually I, I do have a question for you that was not anything that we practiced. Um, when after your stroke, I read all of Marianne's notebooks. She writes longhand. And she had three chapters to remaining for Properties of Thirst. And I thought, they'll be in those notebooks. The answers will be there. Nothing was in the notebooks, even though you often tell your students that they have to know the ending before they begin, correct? Yes, yes, yes. That's very, it's like building a house. You know, you have to plan it out. Otherwise, you're, the structure is going to fail you. Anyway, sure. You're not my students, so I'm, I'm just fell back on that prearranged speech. <laughs> well, sh she knew her ending, but she didn't leave any breadcrumbs in the notebooks for the ending. So, and unfortunately, the stroke erased those the nine years that she had the spent. The book gave me a stroke. The book did not give you a stroke. Not true. But it's true. okay for you to read it. It's also okay for you to write a book. You will not get a stroke just from the act of writing a novel. There is no correlation there. But on the very, in 2007, um, I saw the last words from her previous novel, Shadow Catcher. And the next morning you woke up and you wrote the first paragraph for Properties of Thirst, which remains the first paragraph. And you already knew five of your characters. So where do you think your ideas come from? Oh, I've always been a vivid dreamer, which is probably why I'm a single woman. Because um, I dream away. I know. Um, I think there's other reasons, Mom. There's all right, reasons. okay. <laughs> um, they, they come to me. The characters come to you? Yeah. What do they say? <laughs> Okay, good answer. Good answer. Well, I could listen to your characters, the dialogue that you write all day long. I love reading her oh, dialogue. Thanks. It's it's the banter is fantastic you and it's love wonderful. Me. I do. I love you so much. I do. I love you very much. You know that. Um, but it, when I'm reading your expository prose, something very strange. It's like drinking espresso to me. And I would, was wondering if you could talk about how you manipulate your readers, just like you manipulate all your friends yeah. and your yeah. family. <laughs> Well, we have, for those of you who have traveled abroad, um, I lived for many years in Europe and in England, and I could usually, if some of that time I was in hotel rooms and the rooms, particularly on the continent, the hotel rooms were thinner than hotel room walls here in the United States. And you, I could hear a dialogue through the walls. And I could determine the, which language was being spoken by the rhythms. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom is usually an English language. It's not coincidental that Shakespeare wrote in pentameter. Um, oh, no, in iambic. Um, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. And the heart gives that kind of, if you've listened to heart sounds, it is um, iambic. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. It, and, and so I, I choose my rhythms, my word rhythms, to echo a heart beat. Um, that's just something that I do um, to keep the reader going. And I manipulate the end of sentences 
to match a human heartbeat, or I try to. And, and that's my little trick <laughs> to, ki to keep you turning, oops, excuse me, turning the pages um, and, and breathing and knowing when to stop for the reader to take a breath and, you know, to use the human architects do the same thing when they design a building. They won't tell you this, but they do. They, you know, we are, uh, we are the, the end result of our physical selves. Um, our mind puts the beautiful drapery on it, um, but we are physical creatures. And the heights of our buildings, the widths of our streets, reflect the human stature. So, so does our literature. Definitely our poetry does, and music certainly does. Um, but I have always been of the belief that language reflects the human body, and I try to incorporate that into my works. Did I answer your question, darling? In Brown? my opinion, very well, yes. Thank you. You did, in fact. Okay. Um, there's one thing that no one ever asks you about, which I want to ask you about. Um, the Properties of Thirst is a, it's often described as a sweeping American tale, although it also has been described as a masterpiece. I'm allowed to say that because I'm your daughter and I can brag. Publishers Weekly called it Wiggins' uh, masterpiece is one for the ages. That's kind of amazing. So that made me really happy. But it is a masterpiece. Thank you. She also just won the, I'm going to just keep bragging for a second. She also just won the California Independent Booksellers Association Best Fiction Novel of the Year. Um, last week she won for Properties of the. Um, so she's often asked about the many topics of the book, uh, the water rights in California. It's set in World War II. She's already mentioned the Japanese American internment camp of Manzanar. There's love story, as always, in Mary Ann's books. Um, but in this book, you really wrote a lot about food, and we had the pleasure of having a fantastic meal here in Savannah that we will remember for our lifetimes at the Gray Restaurant, and we've been talking about that food for three days now, so I was wondering why so many passages about food and properties of thirst. My father was a grocer, and at the time that I was growing up, supermarkets had not taken over. There were independent grocers still thriving. Now the supermarkets have pretty much, oh my God. yeah, I'm trashed them out. Oh my oh, God. Hello. What's happening? That's the Sorry. past calling us. <laughs> <laughs> Reminding us. Uh, history will find you. History will find you. <laughs> Sorry, my timer cut you off yeah, about food. No. Oh, that's a timer? No, no, we we're done? not done. We're not done oh. yet. We're, we're getting there. Oh. Um, and Marianne also wanted to put recipe cards originally into the, into the, the book that would fall out. Remember, that was your yeah, plan. Yeah, it was too expensive, my publisher said. And because the book, the, you know, the cards would have to be put into the pages. And it was just too, com it was too complicated a process. Unfortunately. I was told. <laughs> so if there are any inventors out there in the audience, do you think you could figure out how to put cards inside a book? A SCAD student would be great at yeah. that too. That would be yeah. great. Um, I also wanted to ask you, you devoted, in case there are writers in the room, which I imagine there are, and artists, of course, you've devoted your whole life to your art form. Are, are you going to say that you wanted me to devote my whole life to you? <laughs> yeah. No, I realized at four that that was done. There yeah. was no <laughs> surprise she even knows I'm here. Um, <laughs> it's nice that she looked me in the eye, though. Did you see that? That was nice. That hasn't happened in a few years, so that's, that's wonderful. Thanks, Mom. Witnesses. I needed witnesses. Love pouring from her, <laughs> yes, was felt. Um, what, are, what are the pitfalls of... Um, that decision to live an artist's life, and what are the joys? Oh, the joys outweigh the pitfalls, obviously. But to get to the joys, you gotta go through the pitfalls. 
the false R. I write serious fiction, not commercial fiction. Um, not that I trash commercial fiction, but it means, well, the same as commercial food, as opposed right. to garden, what is it? Farm to table? Are you farm to table. You're farm to fi I'm table farm fiction? farm to table fiction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, commercial fiction is predictable. I know. I'm, I'm, don't Them's get me started. Words. They're going to see, you know, ask me questions that are going to show my pretty side. I tried. <laughs> I tried, and that, it's impossible. That is a, <laughs> that is a very but what were the, I'm serious though, Mom. What are some of the joys of making that decision for anybody in the audience who's, it's not an easy cho life choice. It just isn't. No, it's not. Because, I'm an artist because as well. Because publishing has been a very poor um, field, booksellers will t book publishers will tell you, and it's very hard to make, their profit margins are very small. Um, and they are trying to find ways to increase their profit margins. Booksellers failed and Amazons took over. Um, I don't know where y'all buy your books these days, but even I am, am it, the attraction of going online and shopping is overwhelming. I don't have to dress, I can just sit there. I can be drinking while I'm buying. <laughs> you know, there's, some, there's reasons why I love it. I can do it at three o'clock in the morning. It's never closed. But uh, now you can buy from independent booksellers online, which is what we do while you're online. naked and drunk yeah, and, and yeah. It's three, three in the morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the brick and mortar stores are something that we all, if, if, if we care about shopping at all, we're all gonna have to fight for it because everything is going to be online for a while and then there'll be something new to replace that. Galactic, galactic delivery. <laughs> I have no idea what the future will hold, um, which is why I'm gonna start repeating myself because the past- History will find you. History has found me, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. Okay, I'm gonna uh, shut up now. Yes. I wonder, um, this is going so great, but I just wonder if anybody in the audience has questions. Oh, great, because my timer's not working. Fran does. So I have no idea how long we've been. Thank you. I have a, I have a now we're in the present. Oh, well, maybe you are. I, am, I was going to say, I am present with you. It's the ghost um, of present past. <laughs> yeah. What is your present look like? And what my are you present? What does your present look like right now, and what are you planning to do with it? Ooh. Well, I'm here with you. Are you here with me? <laughs> um, my present now is compromised because of my stroke. So I, I used to just walk. I mean, I would have been, I would have been hitting your sidewalks, and and popping into local places. Um, my present now is limited to my daughter pushing me around. Well, she pushes me around anyway. <laughs> um, I am not currently distracted with a novel that has to be written. I'm really not. And I think that's part of, part of the rhythm of, of my lifetime. I mean, it doesn't come as soon. It's my, it's, uh, my life has not been conveniently arranged that as soon as I finish a novel, another novel starts. It did I'm, with this one. Huh. The Shadowcatcher. <coughs> Shadowcatcher, The Properties of Thirst. Overnight. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. But that's the only time that's ever happened to her. Oh. Um, oh, maybe I'm turning into an automaton. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I don't have a new idea. I probably will write about the experience of being in a wheelchair and, and 
I am greatly indebted, if I haven't already said this, to the Vietnam vets organizing after Vietnam to make this country of ours more accessible to those who have put their bodies on the line. I didn't put my body on the line necessarily. Um, my body failed me or failed itself. But fortunately, my country was here to lower their curbsides. <laughs> um, thanks to the veterans of wars saying, hey, you know, help us get around. We did, we did service for you now. We expect our country to do service for us as, we, as it should, as it should. And I know that, that the example of that um, served me well by my European experience choosing to live in England even when I was pregnant, pregnant with this one I had to give up my seat to veterans of war who would wear identifying pins on the metro in Paris. You know, seats are put, are, are put aside for veterans of war to take their comfort over pregnant women. Excuse me, I don't think that's right. <laughs> um, Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I can hear you. Well, in, t in term, I, I don't know if war has been turned 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 into a nas national park. What a stupid name to give to an, a, 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 a former internment camp. It's not a park. Mm -hmm. At any rate, our national park system um, has not elevated all of them. And so no is the answer. I did not. Why, why do you ask? I visited Park Mountain in Wyoming. Oh. There's a park in Wyoming, several different sports organizations, and it's in the community place. Wow. So much impact. Let's all go. Let's rent a bus. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and no, no is the answer, but I would all, I mean, you know, take the kids, have a picnic lunch, make an outing, go visit an internment camp. I mean, can you? No, it is. It's worth it. It is, and Manzanar is, is very moving. I would, I would like to come. Uh, but Marianne researches, well, she calls it working, but um, <laughs> she researches all of her, um, the back history for all of her characters and her novels. And there are a lot of books in mom's house, lots of reading and, and empty wine bottles. <laughs> I'm going to find the answer to life at the bottom of one of those bottles. <laughs> We're going to look this afternoon. Um, when did you begin writing? And was it something fanciful, like fairies? Was it always kind of literary? And when did you realize this could be like a career and a profession? Well, it could, nothing is guaranteed. I didn't realize that it could be a profitable career. Um, and forgive me if I'm repeating myself. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because I was ill as a child. Is that oh, repeating yeah. myself? That yeah. The book lady would come down the, the halls, and I was reading adult fiction early on, and I wanted to, and it so, it's so invigorated me, I wanted that, it was as if I, you know, professional had come into my life. That's something I wanted to do. I knew that mm, preteen, I wasn't a teenager yet, um, and I had no personal exemplar in, in, in our community. I didn't know any writers. I think the idea of a creative writing program was 
hadn't been introduced into American life as yet. That happened in the 60s, possibly in earlier than that, but I don't, I don't, re I don't remember that because I, I was too young to realize that. I hope that answers your question. But it mm -hmm. wasn't fairies and rainbows and unicorns. It was, it was deep, soulful Marianne poetry, and it was, it was very impressive, even in the beginning. Thank you for coming to be with us. Thank you. Of all of these books that you've read through your life, do you have a favorite? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> the one it, that I haven't written yet. Well. <laughs> hi, I'm enjoying you Where so much. You? I'm over here. Wait. Oh, Hello. Hi. Have you ever thought about writing a book about you? Mm, no. <laughs> Why not? You're a very interesting person. Your background is oh. just amazing. And I'll bet you if you made it fiction, you could embellish things a little. Are you looking for a job? <laughs> Oh, that's really kind. Um, no is the answer, and writing autobiography is a very different road. I hide behind my, my fiction characters, and I think with autobiography, at least as a reader of autobiography, I would expect some disclosure. And I like being hidden. These lights are too bright. I know, they're pretty. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, hi, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit into the same subject that she approached. Um, mm -hmm. You're so entertaining to listen to. Oh, well, thank you. And when but you I have dinner reservations for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> I was going to leave him behind. <laughs> But the banter between both of you is, is wonderful. And when we look at the world now, we need humor, sen sense of humor nowadays, but also know how to get through difficult times. And it seems like you have found a way to um, go beyond yourself. And I think many of us could really learn much from you <gasps> by, <laughs> by your humor as well as the way you look at things. You're, you're fact-oriented, so therefore, without doing a personal biography of yourself, you could potentially kind of like surviving life, history, Whoa. our own personal history by everything you've learned along the way and how you approach things. That's so lovely. That's a very nice statement. And, uh, you know, the check is in the mail. <laughs> but do you have a question? <laughs> have you thought about doing that? I mean, seriously, I think there many of us would be oh. really interested in it because, let's face it, life is tough. And being able to get through it with humor and, and grace and in, intelligence and everything, all of that, you know, you, you can't buy that. Just think how much money oh, those books would be worth. <laughs> You, you, that was such a kind thing. Thank you. We've got our marching orders. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, but it, autobiography is a very different part of, of you know, I, I like to be the man behind the curtain. Um, and when that curtain is taken away, I don't want to reveal myself that much. I mean, I, on, on this occasion, it's one thing I can see your faces, but you know, writers don't meet their readers as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, 
a personal decision. I have, I have decided that I want to spend the majority of the hours of my life hidden from people. And that's what writing longhand in a notebook and then sending off the manuscript is not an interpersonal exchange. There are some, there are some months that I don't see another person. And that's, that's very different. I've, I chose that career um, because I, I basically don't like people, so the hell with all of them. <laughs> Please don't come after me after this is over. I'm not signing the goddamn book. <laughs> I think that's a great ending. I mean, that's inspiring. Okay, so if you won't write an autobiography, <laughs> yeah, and we all want to glean so much from your wisdom and your compassion and, and all Have of these life things. Your own. I want the job. <laughs> you know, I want the job. But no. Have you ever thought about a podcast? Because you're you know no. you <laughs> I know you don't like people. I love that idea. Thank you. Well this has been so extraordinary for me. <laughs> Let's give a warm welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, now you're just showing off because you know I can't stand up. Thank you, thank you. And it's the one day we wore mascara, too. Thank you, Claudia. Oh, man. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.